Hello, welcome to Preach and Pray. My name is Andrew Page. I'm part of the teaching team at Above Bar Church. Welcome to you if you're part of the Above Bar Church family or you're part of another church or you're part of no church at all. It's really great that you're here. Uh, Preach and Pray is just a 30 minute thing where we uh, look at a Bible passage together because we believe that God wants to speak to us through the Bible. And we need that at any time and maybe especially during lockdown and the whole coronavirus thing. So we want to look at the Bible together. Uh, today we're starting a new series uh, in Preach and Pray in the second half of the book of Isaiah. And it's called The Servant of the Lord. So we're looking at a number of passages in Isaiah about the servant of the Lord. So if you could turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 41, that would be great. Isaiah chapter 41. And I'm going to read the passage uh, for us. Let's be open to the word of God. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 1. <clears throat> be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to wind-blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not travelled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. The islands have seen it and fear, the ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward, they help each other and say to their companions, Be strong! The metal worker encourages the goldsmith, and the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes the anvil. One says of the welding, It's good! The other nails down the idol so that it will not topple. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp, with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them, and reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them, the wind will pick them up, and a gale will blow them away. But you will rejoice in the Lord, and glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. But I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set junipers in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together so that people may see and know, may consider and understand, the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. That's Isaiah chapter 41, verses 1 to 20, and we're calling this the Chosen Servant. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we have your word in our hands Please take our lives into your hands and speak into them. In Jesus' name, Amen. 
Now, before we get into this passage uh, in Isaiah chapter 41, I need to give us just a little bit of background. In the uh, prophecy of Isaiah so far, Isaiah has come up with a warning for Israel. He said this, one day Jerusalem is going to lie in ruins and Israel is going to be in exile in Babylon. They'll have been conquered by the Babylonians and they will be in exile. And many people in the people of Israel, in God's people, will have given up and given in. They will have given up hope and they will have given in to fear. And so Isaiah goes on to prophesy in chapters 40 onwards. And we're, we're looking at those chapters. And during this time, he wants to give hope or God wants to give hope through Isaiah to his people in exile. And he keeps talking about the servant of the Lord. Now, sometimes in these chapters, the servant of the Lord is the people of Israel called to be God's servant. Sometimes, though, the servant of the Lord is an expression which looks forward much further on in human history, much further on. And it looks forward to the day when an individual will come who will be the servant of the Lord and who will put everything right. And the New Testament tells us that that servant of the Lord is Jesus. But in this passage today, in chapter 41, the servant of the Lord is the nation of Israel. So let's be open to the Holy Spirit and uh, I'll be asking him to speak into our lives. First of all, in uh, verses one to seven, God is the Lord of history, the Lord of history. This is so important. Verse one, be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. And then in verse two, Isaiah asks a question. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to wind-blown chaff with his bow. This is a reference almost certainly to Cyrus, the king of Persia. Cyrus was going to begin to rampage around the Middle East, destroying nations, doing all the things that's, that are written down there in verses 2 and 3. Look at verse 3. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not travelled before. And then comes the question. In this crisis situation, this powerful King Cyrus. Verse 4. Who has done this? And carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. In other words, I'm the Lord of history. Not Cyrus. Cyrus looks as though he's in control, but he's not. I the Lord, I am the Lord of history. And we need to hear that. Or well, we need to hear it in our present situation now when we look at our world and we think, what on earth is going on here? What's going to become of us all? We're thinking that about the world or about our nation or about our family or about ourselves. Well, we can hear these words. God is the Lord of history. Now, how do the nations react to that? In verses five and six, they tell one another to be strong. And some of the nations even start building other gods, building new gods. That's what verse seven is about. The metal worker encourages the goldsmith and the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes the anvil. One says of the welding, it is good. The other nails down the idol so that it will not topple. They're building idols. They think somehow that's going to get them out of their hole, out of their problem out of danger. But God is saying, I am the Lord of history. And we need to hear that. Do you believe that God is the Lord of history? If you do, embrace that. Thank God for it now. That whatever else is happening, whatever we're going through, God is the Lord of history. Secondly, in verses 8 to 20, God is the lover of Israel. 
Now, I love this. Twice in verses 8, 9 and 10, God describes Israel as his servant. Have a look at it. Verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. Israel is God's servant. God is saying to Israel, you are in a very difficult situation in exile. You are, you're going through very tough times, but you're my servant. There's a relationship here. I've called you to be my servant. We belong to one another. You belong to me. And I belong to you as your Lord. You are my servant. And God says three things to Israel here in verses 8, 9 and 10, which just underline the fact that he is the lover of Israel. I love these three things. Have a look at them with me. First of all, he says, I chose you. It's there in verse 8. Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. It's there in the second half of verse 9. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. I chose you, Israel. It wasn't your idea to become the people of God. It was my idea. I chose you. I chose Abraham, who's my friend. Well, I haven't changed my mind about you now. I chose you. That's the first sentence. The first, second sentence is, I'm with you. Have a look at that. Verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. You may feel very alone. You may feel very confused about life, but I am with you. And the third sentence is, I'll help you. It's in the second half of verse 10. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to, I'm going to do all the things necessary to get you through this and beyond. Do you hear those three sentences? I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. And if you think about those three sentences, they're wonderful because they, 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 they talk about the past, the present and the future. In the past, I chose you. In the present, I'm with you. In the future, I'll help you. That is massive encouragement for Israel and massive encouragement for us. God is the lover of Israel. Now, Israel is feeling pretty, pretty down. Israel is in a tough situation, but God is going to work because he's promised to help them. I, I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. How is Israel feeling at the moment and what is going to do, God going to do? Uh, Israel feels afraid. Look at verse 13. I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear I will help you. Don't be afraid. God understands that Israel is feeling afraid and he says you don't need to be afraid. And the way he helps them to, to deal with their fear is he reminds them who he is. Look at verse 14. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob, little Israel. Do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Remember who I am. Israel feels afraid, but God has an answer. Secondly, Israel feels weak, but look what God will do. Verse 11, all who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. It'll be like your enemies are going to evaporate, Israel. You'll wonder where they've gone. Like they've gone up in a, in a puff of smoke. I am there. I'm with you. I'm going to help you. And more than that, I'm going to turn you, Israel, into a threshing sledge. <laughs> it's really hard for me to say that phrase, a threshing sledge. 
Uh, look, it's down there in verse 15. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. Now, I don't know about agriculture, but apparently a threshing sledge was a, 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 a piece of wood like this. And it had heavy weights on it. So it was really heavy. And underneath it, it had pieces of metal or pieces of wood sticking down that were sharp like teeth. And the threshing sledge was dragged across a field after, at harvest time and it helped with the harvesting. It cut things up. It's a threshing sledge. Now, God is saying to Israel, do you feel very weak? Do you feel like your problems are like mountains? We'll look again at verse 15. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them and reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them. The wind will pick them up and the gale will blow them away. I'm going to make you into a threshing sledge, Israel, that will cut the mountains down to size. I'm with you. I'm going to help you. And that's going to result in Israel praising God. At the end of verse 16, you will rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. So Israel feels afraid. Israel feels weak. Israel also feels empty. Look at verse 17. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. That may not be talking literally about not having enough to eat and drink. It may be, but it may not be. It's just talking about the fact that they feel they've got no resources. They are empty. But look what God promises. But I, the Lord, verse 17, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set junipers in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together, so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this that the Holy One of Israel has created it. I'm going to give you everything you need, Israel. Do you see that these are all signs that God is the lover of Israel? I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. I'll help you when you feel afraid. I'll help you when you feel weak. I'll help you when you feel empty. I'll help you. I'm here for you. Remember who I am. Fantastic promises. Astonishing encouragement. Now, if you are a truster in Jesus, and many of us who are watching this now probably are, many of us who are now looking at this Bible passage, we have turned from our sins and put our trust in Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the ultimate fulfilment of the servant of the Lord. Then we have started to follow Jesus. We trust him. We know we're forgiven because he died on the cross for us and we're now following him. But sometimes don't we feel afraid? Maybe particularly at a time like this. Sometimes... We feel weak. Sometimes we feel empty. All of us, all of us. I don't think there's anybody watching this who is never afraid or weak or empty. Well, then we need to listen to God. We need to listen to Jesus because the wonderful thing is Jesus is saying to us now, what God was saying to the nation of Israel in Isaiah chapter 41. I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. Think for a minute. And if you are a truster in Jesus, when I talk about Jesus for a few minutes, do remember this. This is your Jesus I'm talking about. This is the Jesus you have come to trust. This is the Jesus you have come to love because you realise how much he loved you by going to the cross to die for your sins. Well, he's risen and he is speaking now to us through his word. Jesus says to us, I chose you. He said that to his disciples, didn't he? You didn't choose me. I chose you. That's John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 16. I chose you. I mean, 
When you became a Christian, do you think God was surprised? Was he surprised that you had the Christian parents you had? He gave you those parents. Or maybe it wasn't your parents who introduced you to Jesus. It was other people. Well, was God surprised when you met those friends who knew Jesus and encouraged you to think about Jesus? No, God was at work. He took the initiative. Jesus says, I chose you. Ah, oh, that should fill us with just a confidence and a reassurance and a peace. Jesus says, I chose you. Secondly, Jesus says, I'm with you. He said that to his disciples, didn't he? It's the last verse of Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. I am with you always to the very end of the world. I'm with you always. That is the promise of Jesus. I am with you. Well, he's saying that to us. I'm with you now in the present, in the in the situation you, you're in, the tough situation with the lockdown and with the virus and concern and worry about the nation, about our families, about ourselves. Jesus says, I'm with you. You are not going through this on your own. I am with you. Oh, if you believe that that's true, just lift your heart now to Jesus and thank him that he is with you. I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. Jesus promised his disciples that he would send the Holy Spirit so that when they, they, they came to know him personally, the Holy Spirit would come into their lives. And he talks about the Holy Spirit and describes him, him as the helper. That's John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 7. The Holy Spirit is the helper. And if you turn from your sins and put your trust in Jesus, then the Holy Spirit has come into your life. He lives in you now. The Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God is living in you and he is the helper. The fact that you've got this far through the lockdown is because the Holy Spirit has helped you. And he will continue to help you in the future. Jesus says, I will help you. And he helps us by his Holy Spirit, especially he helps us by his Holy Spirit, taking the word of God and using it in our lives, which is what's happening at the moment. It's a supernatural event. Do you feel the power of the word of God because the Holy Spirit is at work? The chosen servant. Israel was the chosen servant. And God encourages Israel in their tough situation. He says, I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. Jesus, the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. If we know him, if we trust him, if we've, if we've opened our lives up to him, he says those things to us. Do you feel afraid? Do you feel weak? Do you feel empty? Well, listen, says Jesus, I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. Let's open up our lives to him again. And commit our lives to him and ask him to work into our lives. But let's take those three sentences with us. Let's remember those three sentences that he is speaking to us. And they will make the coming days and weeks and months different. I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you know how we're doing. Some of us maybe are feeling great at the moment and some of us really aren't. Some of us are feeling afraid or weak or empty. Thank you for sending Jesus, your son, for people like us. 
Thank you that he died so we could be forgiven. Thank you that he rose again to proclaim his victory. And Lord Jesus, thank you for what you are saying to us. I chose you. I'm with you. I'll help you. Let's have a moment's silence for each of us to respond to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray on for our church family at Above Bar Church or for whatever church we're part of. We pray for people struggling with new or existing mental health issues. We pray for couples rearranging their weddings now that small ceremonies are allowed again. We pray for people having to cope with self-isolation while others are getting about more. We pray especially for Jean Maybe, who has been in and out of hospital with various health issues. Father, please let Jean know that you chose her, you're with her and you'll help her. And Father, we bring now to you other individuals we can think of who are especially in need at the moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, we pray for Peter and Kate Nolson and for all our sent mission partners. Thank you for all you've done through Peter and Kate to build your kingdom in Spain. We pray for Peter and Kate and their church family. Please give wisdom as they decide when they can meet in the church building again. We pray for Peter as he teaches online for the seminary. We pray, Father, that you would equip the students so that they may more effectively share the good news of Jesus in the country of Spain. And Father, we commit Peter and Kate to you. Thank you so much for their faithfulness. We pray that as they care for others, you would give them joy in one another and joy in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you that you are in control of our world. You are the Lord of history. We pray that you'd help us to hang on to that, to believe it, to trust you. Please help our government and governments around the world. Please guide their decisions. We pray for the many people around the world who are looking for you as a result of this pandemic. Father, we pray for people who are feeling um, afraid or weak or empty. We pray for people who are looking for you in this situation, calling out to you, asking you to reveal yourself. And we pray that through this time, many, many people will come to know you through putting their trust in Jesus, your son. Father, we bring all our prayers to you in the great and strong name of Jesus. Amen. I am the Lord your God who takes you by the right hand. I will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the God of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.